Today's scripture reading is taken from Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of God. Hi, ABC. Welcome to uh, this uh, week's uh, Sunday service where it's on the Advent series. Uh, my name is John and I'll be going through it with you on this topic called Why Christmas Matters. Now, so on this Advent series that we have, uh, I, I, sell, I asked myself, what is Advent actually? I actually didn't really know. So what I did was I went online and actually searched to know a little bit more about it. And Advent actually means the arrival of a notable person or thing. Okay? So what are we waiting for? And uh, this is what we're going to be talking about for today. But there are a lot of traditions that I think is quite interesting and I want to in, uh, implement into my family as well. So for example, there's this Advent reef that you see over here. The Advent reef is made of evergreens, which signifies of uh, continuous life in the midst of winter and death. There are five candles, each of them having their own meanings. So uh, they signify hope, faith, joy, peace. And the middle of it is actually Jesus Christ, right, the light of the world. So uh, interesting things, and why I want to do it is because my kids love candles, so I think they'll enjoy it. So every Sunday, you're supposed to light one of them, uh, every single Sunday uh, before Christmas, and on the last day, on, uh, on the last, uh, I think on Christmas, you would light on the fifth one. So interesting stuff for us to know. Now, when we talk about Advent, it is talking about waiting for somebody, or something important to happen. And Isaiah gave this prophecy that uh, was being given by Sarah just now, and so thanks so much for that, Sarah. And this prophecy was given in this timeline. So after the nation of Israel was being set up, King Saul was the first king. And after 300 years of it, this is where Isaiah's prophecy came. And so why was there a prophecy? And what were they waiting for? That's the question we want to actually go through today. And so what they were waiting for was actually they were waiting for deliverance, waiting for somebody to save them. Why do they need somebody to save them? Because the nation of Israel was actually in trouble. How were they in trouble? The people were actually suffering, right? Because out of all the kings that they had, most of them were actually bad kings. So if you see over here, red color means they are bad kings, yellow, yellow color means they are so-so, and green means they are good kings. So I did a quick check, there's about 10% of good kings, 90% of them are actually really terrible ones. Right. And so they were not living in a good condition. And on top of that, what happened was, there was Assyria as well. So Assyria was a neighboring country that was looking to uh, come and attack them. And they were all they were very worried about it. What would happen if uh, Assyria came? And why was uh, Assyria so uh, scary is because when it comes to Assyria, they were uh, famous for being cruel. They torture all the people, and if you don't surrender, uh, many bad things will happen to you. For example, they will skin you alive. Okay? If not, they may impale you as well. In fact, there was one article I read online, they said that they asked the, the notable man over there to wear the 
head of the king as a necklace. So all of these things happen, and in the midst of all this, Isaiah is telling uh, the people of Israel that hope is coming, deliverance is coming. Right? God is not going to let them be uh, alone, and God will save them. So this is where we have this Bible verse. Right? Uh, on verse 2 and verse 4, here it says that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. So, when you see this, right, what is happening is really, they are waiting for deliverance, right? Because for the past few years, things have been very challenging, and even after that, actually, they go into exile. So, it was after about 700 years, only then, the Messiah would come. Now, so because of that, there's Advent for them. But how about for us, actually? So for us, why do we still need to remember Advent? What is Advent for? Get to us. Now, what you see here is number one. For us, Advent is to remember the first coming of Christ, and also at the same time, to anticipate the second coming of Christ. That is Advent for us. And every year we go through this to remember and also to know that we are not just here, you know, chilling and resting on earth. There's still stuff to do as well. Now, so first point that we have for today is why do we need a savior? We don't have any Assyrians or we don't have bad kings, right? We don't have all these challenges. Why do we need a savior? Now, so in fact, I would say that a lot of times we can say, you know, things are going to be all right. You know, it's true that currently there are a lot of challenges in the world. When it comes to you know, the COVID, all of us know there are challenges. Is life really okay? And that's what we want to really explore and really process for today. So I have a series of uh, photos and things I've found online. I just want to share with you to let you see how the world really is. Okay, first one. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect and who look forward to something greater to come, which means that you cannot be celebrating Advent if you don't think that something is wrong. Okay? You can only be celebrating Advent if you know that you need deliverance, you need a savior, you need someone to come to you. So let's look at what's happening to our world now. Right, first one over here. Do you see anything wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Well, it looks okay. Huh? Yeah, there are two kids uh, being very hardworking, studying over there. Friends, what you see here is actually not a room. This is a house in Hong Kong. So what you see here is it is their study table, it is their bed, and it's also their wardrobe. Can you see that they're hanging their clothes here? Right? And it's actually very hot, there's no aircon. And so how does their house look like? So let's compare your house with their house. This is their kitchen and bathroom. They're next to each other. And if you want to see how the parents actually cook, you can see the meat here, and they're preparing the food. This is how they sleep. Okay, so imagine sleeping next to the bathroom, and this is not a nice condition, obviously. And this, friends, is a failure of capitalism. For those people who are a bit more wealthy, they get a house like this. Those who are really very poor, right, they stay in these places called coffin cages that looks like this. So this old uncle here doesn't have much money and they stay over there, right? And friends, you need to understand, this is actually happening in Hong Kong, one of the very rich countries, but the social disparity, the income inequality is so big over there. Now, when we talk about income inequality, you can see that this is not happening only in Hong Kong, it's happening in US and everywhere. And the stats is showing you that it is continuing to rise and the difference is increasing. So this is from US. And in US, what it's saying is the top 1% income share has doubled while poverty has held steady. So the number of people being poor has almost been the same since 1969 until 2017. So that's how much? That's 40 years. Within 40 years, the number of people being poor has been the same. Right? in terms of percentage. But the rich has actually gotten more and more of the share of wealth in the nation. Right? And this is only until 2017. If you take in MCO, you take in your whole 2020 insight, this will be even higher. Right? So no matter what happens, you see the rich getting richer, the poor uh, being in their uh, current state. So what can we do? Is life really okay? Now, if you continue on checking it in, there's even more stuff for you to see. So for example, I'm quite sure many of you go to Lazada, 
go to Shopee and buy stuff, right? And you're wondering, oh, you know, I'm helping the economy. But as you're helping the economy, there's also people who are working to death. So let me share with you this uh, image I found online. So Mr. Kim actually is from Korea and he worked to death. After working for 21 hours, he called his friend and said, can I stop the next shift? I'm really, very really tired. I'm going to rest. The answer was no. Continue. He continued working and four days later he died. And he's not the only one. There's more than, there's about 14, 15 of them going through this. And why? Business too good. And business is too good. Your people still need to work. And this is a result of it as well. That is on the financial side. But how about on others, you know? So if this is the case, let's do more charity. Let's help more people. Now, friends, Malaysia is also famous. This is something that happened in Malaysia. This guy's name is Richard Huckle. It's a guy that when I read what he says, I'm just, uh, I feel very uneasy. Right? Why? So let me read, what, let me read you some of the things he said. Impoverished kids are definitely much easier to seduce than middle-class Western kids. I hit the jackpot. A three-year-old girl was as loyal to me as my dog, and nobody seemed to care. So who is this guy? This guy is actually a pedophile. He came to Malaysia, and under the disguise of being a Christian, he goes around charities, homes, and all that to help people. And what he's doing is really nasty stuff to kids. And this is what is happening. But friends, what you're seeing is the issue that is happening is not just one person. It's also there's lack of support for all these charity organizations and also lack of accountability. You know why? Because when there's not enough support for these organizations, if anyone is willing to help, they say, come, please help. I am willing for help. But we don't really check whether when a person comes to organizations to help, how are they? Are really good or not? Right. So if I continue going through this, you see also that there are a lot of other issues. For example, I have over here Donald Trump. We are living in a post-truth era. Now, what does it mean for, for this? It means that it's very hard to tell what is real and what's fake anymore. This is actually not Donald Trump. It's a deep fake video. Okay? It's an image where it was created by somebody in Belgium, if not Mexican, and they actually created a video whereby Donald Trump is saying something bad to, for some of the political campaign that they're trying to do over there. But in reality, he didn't say it. So it comes to this. If you hate this guy, you see a video like this, you believe that he's really saying it, and so even a character assassinate somebody is very easy. Even to cause any issues, any uproars in society, it becomes very easy because it's already becoming very hard to tell what is true, what's not true. Imagine if suddenly uh, I show you a video of your husband doing something with another uh, woman. What will you think? And friends, this is going to come. How do we tell what's true, what's not true anymore? What do we believe? And I would say, in the West, this is happening and it's coming to Malaysia and Asia as well. And what we are talking about is polarization. What's polarization? It means that two groups of people are basically direct opposites. They do not make friends, they do not even want to talk, talk to each other. And what I'm showing you here is the Black Lives Matters movement. So, uh, one of the, there was somebody being killed, and because of that, there was a whole riot happening. And in the riots, a lot of stores and shops across the whole America was being destroyed. There's vandalism, and people go in to loot, okay, to rob, to take things and run. So, now, I want you to take note of what's being said by this article here. It says, big retailers say they don't mind the looting. Okay, they don't mind the looting. You know why? If you dare come out to say that looting is wrong, destroying, property is wrong, you will be in deep trouble. Okay? So what they have come up to now is this. Either you are with us or you are against us. If you say looting is wrong, it means that you don't care about black people. That is happening. Yeah? Polarization. And all this is happening also because of the people that we choose, the leaders we choose. Currently, there is no civil discourse. What it means is, if you wear a face mask in the US, it means, number one, you are Democrats. Right? Because coronavirus is fake. That's what they're saying. And if you go online and check out what Donald Trump is talking about, you understand that he's been always denying all these things. But friends, why has it come to the point whereby we can no longer talk to each other? Why has it come to the point whereby if I actually don't agree with you, then I'm wrong? Why can't we try to understand each other's point of view? And friends, this looks like something small, but when the whole society is not able to communicate, to really come to agreement, to really discuss things, you cannot progress. A lot of things cannot be done. 
Now, why is all this happening to the world? It is happening to the world the same reason why Israel is actually going through challenges at the time of Isaiah. And what happened to them was that Israel rejected God as king. From the beginning of time, even before that, they've been rejecting God as king, and this is the result of it. So you see over here on 1 Samuel 8, uh, verses uh, 7 to 8, what you see is the Lord told Samuel, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. So what happened was, Israel was actually looking for, uh, for a king because they had no king, and they said, I want to be like other countries. We need a king to be with us. What they are really effectively saying is, we don't want God as king. We want to rule our own lives. God is not good enough. Let's do it ourselves. Let's do it our way. So, friends, what we're talking about is actually the heart of the human problem is a problem of the human heart. The problem is not with which minister, is not with which president, is not with which uh, society, which, uh, which uh, financial system we are having. All these things, even if you remove capitalism and, repute, and you actually put something else, th things will still go wrong. Why? Because the problem is people. People will always want to take advantage of each other and they always are selfish. And that is why when we ask ourselves, why do we need a savior? The answer is because we cannot save ourselves. We are actually in deep trouble. Now, who is this savior? Who is this savior that we're talking about? Now in Isaiah 9 verse 6, we have been given four names of the savior. Let's go through them. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So these are four names given to this upcoming Messiah. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Simple names, but what does it really mean? So let's go through them one by one, and let's see what they are. First one, Wonderful Counselor. When we talk about counselling, we think about somebody sitting in a therapy chair, you know, and then telling you, how do you feel? Do you want uh, this? Or they try to guide you on life. But when we talk about counsellor, a wonderful counsellor, what we're saying is that when it comes to life, if you want wisdom, don't go to people. Go to God. Go to the person that actually can see the past, the present, and the future. And God is the one that we should go to for counsel. So, in fact, counselling is so important that we rise and fall on counsel. You look at the first uh, story in uh, Adam and Eve. Why did Eve fall? What was the reason for Eve actually uh, being tempted? It was because of the snake. The snake was the one actually telling Eve the things that it's not supposed to do. Right? The, the snake asked, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Okay, Eve replied, and they talked at the end of the day, after the counsel of the snake, Eve decided, yeah, this fruit is good to be eaten, and she ate it. Okay, counsel is very important. And let me share you a story that I have. So, years ago, I was uh, in the IT business, and I spot a very good opportunity to be doing. So what happened was, I spoke to my friend about it, I took counsel, and my friend told me, oh, you want to do this thing? I know of these um, people, I used to talk to them, and they're actually uh, owners of lesser companies. Talk to them, they can help you. Okay? They can help you to get this uh, business idea up. So what I did is, I went to talk to them, and there was a match. They had certain infrastructure that I needed, and I have certain resources that I could actually uh, lend as well. So we worked together, we signed a whole agreement, and shareholders agreement, and we got everything done. Right? But what happened was, after one year working on it, the product actually really came to market and it was something that was really good. Okay. But what happened was, after the product went live, I got news that they took the entire product and they tried to generate revenue from a different company. So they copied it out, put it somewhere else, and tried to generate revenue on their own without me. Now friends, actually throughout my entire experience with them, I started to see problems coming. I actually knew that there was something that was being done that was not right. But what I thought in my, uh, in my head was, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they're not, so you know, they do something which is a bit grey. Okay, la, I don't really know. La. It's okay. La. Just as long as they can help me, la, I don't really care. So that was what I was doing. 
right? I took counsel from my friend, and after that, so it looks like such a good opportunity. Let's do it, and that's why I did it. But friends, at the end of the day, I wasted my whole one year, right? And it was a very painful journey for me. Now, definitely God uh, let me learn a lot of stuff through it as well, and I grew through the experience. And we know that, you know, all things work together for the good of, you know, those who love Him. We know all this. But it doesn't put out the fact that actually, if I actually took counsel from God from the start, things would be different. Don't you agree? Let me show you. If I actually read the Bible at that time and remember Psalm 1 verse 1, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Actually, if I read this and I know that these guys I'm dealing with are not really good people to deal with, I should have stopped dealing with them from the start, no matter how nice it sounded. So friends, that was my experience. And friends, I'm going to share with you, when it comes to counsel, you really need to get God's counsel. Don't listen to people. Who knows the future? Things may look very good, especially when it comes to business or even your career, friends. Okay? For those of you young adults or you know, you're in your O levels or your SPM, you're looking to graduate, you're wondering what to do. Friends, don't seek counsel from your peers. Ask God. Take the time to really ask God, what should I do? Because this God loves us and He will help us. I hope this story can help you to understand counsel is very important and get your counsel from God. Now, the second thing that we're talking about today is mighty God. When you say the word mighty God, it doesn't sound anything powerful to you. But if I say the word dato, tan sri, many of you say, whoa, yeah, you know, this guy is powerful. Or I say things like, for example, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, machine learning. For us, we, it, comes to a, a, it comes to our mind that there's something very powerful over there. But when it comes to God, for us, somehow it's actually become very mild and we don't really understand what it means. So if you really want to understand what does mighty God mean, you need to understand for the Israelites, what do they see God as? Who is God actually? And what you see is, this is the Ark of the Covenant. And there was a story in Samuel where the Ark of the Covenant was being brought to war, okay? Against the wishes of, um, uh, in, a, in the wrong way, it was being brought to war. And so the Israelites were being punished and they lost the war. And this Ark of Covenant were being taken away to the Philistines' land. And this story, what you see is, no matter where the Ark went, they actually uh, inspired awe and fear in everybody out there. Because no matter where the Ark went, people started dying. There were tumors, there were rats everywhere. So from city to city, once they heard that the Ark of God is coming, they were already very afraid. At the end of the day, what they did need to do, they needed to give a peace offering and send the ark back to Israel. And friends, this is God. If you talk about God, you can remember in um, the days of Moses, what happened, the parting of the Red Sea and all this. And friends, so when we talk about God, we need to understand God is really, really mighty. And so if you have any problems, you have any challenges in life, and you need someone to help you, perhaps ask God. God is here to assist us, and He wants us, He wants a good for us as well. So don't forget, at the end of the day, if you have any issues, always come back to God. God will be there for, will be there for us. The next name, he'll be called Everlasting Father. Now, so this is a photo of a baby and I'm a father myself now, I have two kids. So I find that having a father is actually very nice. You know why? When you're father, you actually have somebody to take care of you care for you. You don't even need to worry about anything. My kids don't need to worry. I already plan out for them, you know, what's going to happen next. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of things that we do. We provide. We want to take care of our children. And the same goes for my father. I have a father and my father takes care of me as well. So he helps me a lot with things and he's always nice to me. Uh, it'd be surprising to let you, let you know that I've not heard my father getting angry for at least the past 15 years. And he's always there for me and for whatever I need. Okay, when we eat groceries, helping out with the kids, helping out with the house, even helping out with work. He helps me with all these things. So having a father is actually something very special. Uh, when it comes to fathers, human fathers will always fall short. I will fall short. Sometimes my kids tell me, Daddy, can you read me a story? My says, okay, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. So there were a few times when I said I'm coming. In the end, when I reached their room, they actually fell asleep already. Why? I was too tired. I wanted to watch my TV. 
So my wife is scolding me because of that also. But you see, fathers will fall short. And in our lives, perhaps we may have actually experienced times when our fathers have fell, fallen short. And this is actually some statistics given by the US. Why? When your father is absent, these are things that can happen. 63% of youth suicides happen in homes with absent fathers. 90% 90 of homelessness and runaway children are from such families. Right? When the father is not there, all these things are happening. Dropouts, behavior disorders, or even rapists with anger problems. Fathers are important, and God wants to be our father. But more than that, he's our everlasting father, which means that you don't need to worry about your father not being there. He will always be there for us. Right? And what's more, he knows everything. He knows what's going to happen, and he's there to defend us, to protect us, and to help us. So we can be very thankful that you know, God wants to be a father, and for us to actually experience the love that he has for us. Final one, Prince of Peace. Uh, this name is again a very normal name you hear. And uh, when I was young, I saw this photo a few times already. You know, you always see Jesus riding a donkey and so oh, peace, yeah, peace. What does it mean to us? What does peace mean to us? Peace is actually the word shalom in the Bible. What is shalom? Shalom is more than just peace. Peace means basically in our terms normally just no fighting, peace. Ah. But it means much more than that. Shalom means also not only the absence of actually fighting, but also both parties mutually agree to say that we are on good terms. Because you can use law to say that from now on you cannot fight. I can say that, okay, because I'm America, I'm the, the biggest uh, country in the world, right? I'm the most powerful country in the world, you cannot fight with me. So all these things can happen, but that is not real peace. Real peace is when both parties actually agree to say that they want to have a good relationship. Shalom also means bringing restitution. If something has been done wrong, restitution will be done. We do something to make amends. Shalom also means completeness, which means that you feel that everything in life is actually perfect. Okay? It's a wholeness and satisfaction. And this spiritual, social, and physical flourishing, flourishing only comes from God. That is shalom, friends. And God wants to give us this shalom that we are talking about here. The best picture for you to see what shalom is, what Prince of Peace is, is this photo. This is Shalom, where we are being brought back to the days of Adam and Eve, where we are in harmony with each other. No more fighting, you know, the lion and the lamb, the animals can all be together. There's no issues, there's no more wars, and everybody lives peacefully. That is peace. Now, who is this Savior? That was our question asking earlier. And this Savior that we have is Jesus Christ. When we talk about Jesus, what does Jesus really want from us? What does our Savior want from us? That's the next question we have. When Jesus came to the world, he died for our sins, and he actually uh, got resurrected, and he's waiting for us again, and he'll come again. But what does our Savior want from us? So over here, what I want to share with you is, Jesus has given us peace with God. And in Romans 5, verse 1 to 2, it says that, Therefore, since we have been justified, through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. God wants us to firstly make peace with God. Because if you really want to have peace amongst people, you need to firstly have peace with God first. Because God made us, He knows how we are supposed to work, how we are supposed to live, how we are supposed to relate with each other. Therefore, the wisdom of the world really is in God. And Jesus wants to give us this peace. Now, I have this photo that I want to share with you. If you want to understand what Jesus really wants from us, I want to share with you that many a times we always think that, oh, be, become, becoming a Christian is like getting a bus ticket and just waiting for time to go to heaven. After you've done the sinner prayers, yeah, done already. Okay, now I can just relax, play my PS, do whatever I want, go and makan makan, you know, go around, do my stuff, just waiting. I'm just waiting to die, you know, that's all I'm doing. Right? But friends, when we talk about this shalom that God wants to give us, it's way more than that. Okay? And so I have this story over here that I'm gonna show, share with you. This is a story of a goldfish. This is not a blackfish, this is a goldfish. Now this is something that is very famous on TikTok, and there's this lady, he brought home a 10-year-old sick and dying fish over here. So this fish was uh, sick and dying in the pet store and nobody wanted it. This girl brought it back, 
And this fish cannot swim. So it's a fish, but it cannot swim, right? It always laid on the substrate and it always had problems because the lesions and the fins were not working properly. This girl loved the fish, cared for the fish, and gave the fish a name. The fish is called Monstro, okay, after the Pinocchio whale. She set up a shallow hospital tank with aquarium salt to help the fish to get better. So you see there's some, something wrong with the fish. And slowly, after a week, the fish began to eat. The girl actually thought the fish would die, but she continued caring and helping this fish. And so after a while, the fish started to eat and started to swim. And the amazing thing happened after that. The fish changed its color from black and became to become golden. And it got really big as well. And so now it's actually a goldfish. From a black fish has become a goldfish. So friends, for, our, for those of you, instead of thinking about uh, long theological discussions, this shows you really what God wants to do with us. God wants to really take us from whatever dirt, whatever situation we have, and really help us to get out of the mess we have. Because we're in deep mess, but sometimes we don't even know we're in it. And God has the biggest plan, the best plan for us. Right? And so He wants to help us with all these things that I've shared just now. Now, so this is a comparison for you to see from a black fish that's very thin and uh, not looking good until this one, right? And how does this relate to us now? Coming back to this chart that I have here, we know that Isaiah's prophecy came here, and after that they went to exile, and Christ did come, right? So Advent is for us to remember Christ came, and Christ is going to come again, and we are here in the present. We've been waiting for 2,000 years, and we are patiently waiting. We don't know when Christ is coming. But I want to share with you something else that I want to put on this slide. And that is number one. Christ didn't just leave us here. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us. And so we're actually walking day, daily with God and making sure that we can actually know what God wants us to do. And He is here to guide us daily. Number two, instead of patiently waiting, we're supposed to be actively waiting. It means that instead of sitting on the sofa every day thinking what to eat next, what to cook next, where to go next, which holiday destination next, after COVID, what's the first thing I do, which vaccine I want to take, we should be actively thinking, you know, what are we supposed to do next? Is there somebody that can help? Is there some way I can serve? Is there somebody that's in need? So why? Because this shalom from the Prince of Peace does not start after the second coming of Christ. It can start today. And it starts through us. Because for some reason, God has decided to use us to be His agents of shalom. And friends, therefore, I strongly encourage you to use your time and all you can to serve together with God. And it's a very exciting and adventurous journey that you can have. Now, how can we do it in our lives? So let me, I'm just taking some stuff from Facebook to show you what I see. Uh, perhaps a few things we can do. Number one, in your work, Instead of just doing the normal 9 to 5, okay, time to go off, and you just go off, perhaps go the extra mile. Go the extra mile so that your employer or your colleagues can see that you're different. If somebody's in need of help, somebody doesn't know how to do something, don't just say that, oh, too bad for you, you're going to get a bad rating. Go and try to help them. Serve each other. You know, at the end of the day, if we can continue to serve each other, people will see. So I have a few examples of it to show to you. So this is Hannah Yor. And she has, on Mother's Day, she has this Mummy's Take 5 while I read to your kids. So she did some story reading for kids in this year's Mother's Day during MCO. And friends, she didn't need to do that. In fact, you know many people, after they become politicians, right, you don't see them after the election. They only come out before election. Right? But for Hannah Yaw, she does a lot of stuff. You will always see her doing something. Because friends, She's a self-professing Christian, and she is trying to serve wherever that she is at. And friends, we can also do that. So some of us, maybe we're not politics. We're not in politics. We can do other things in our own career, in the work that we have. Yeah. Now, another one. This is my friend, uh, Sasibai Kimis. She came back from uh, overseas. She actually studied in Wharton, but she decided to come back to Malaysia because she wanted to start this uh, company called Earth Fair as well to really build the nation. And she said that we always complain. Malaysians are famous for complaining, saying that this thing is bad, politics are bad, nation is bad, everything is bad. If we always, if everybody leaves the country, 
there cannot be enough nucleus in the country, there cannot be enough agents of change for things to happen. And therefore, she says that she wants to come back and drive change in the country. So these are things that we can do. Or perhaps we can even just do what God asks us to do. Besides serving in our original occupations, our family, and maybe to our neighbours, I want to encourage all of you to do something extra. And what is that? This is what I would like to encourage all of you to be actually getting involved in. Besides serving in all this, we can also serve in FPC. And FPC needs help. Okay? The church is actually comprising of every single one of us. And it's not something that is being left to the pastors, to the elders, or only a few of us. Everybody is supposed to be serving together. And it's a great joy and privilege to be serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So I want to share with you uh, something I really appreciate from the FPC Kindy Sunday School. This is uh, what my son has been doing for the past uh, six, seven months since MCO until now. So uh, we have teacher Jen, teacher Emmeline, teacher Fion and teacher Cindy week in and week out helping to make sure that there is Sunday school for my son and all the other kids. Now how do you have Sunday school when there's actually you know, uh, not able to come to school, cannot come to church? What they've been doing is they've been having Zoom sessions with my kid and my son is only six years old. So there's a lot of challenges but they continue to persevere and put in effort. So besides the normal Sunday school, they even ask them to do crafts, uh, you know, send them homework, something to do, some nice crafts because kids love it, to make sure that the kids are connected to God and the Sunday school environment can continue to be there and the, ch the children will be able to know who Jesus is as well. So aside from that, we can serve in so many different ways. So in front of me, I have Luke, I have Malcolm over here serving as well, right? So we can be serving. And it's this, I'm actually here on a Saturday and they are actually spending a Saturday doing this. So I encourage all of you to find a way to serve. If God has given you some talent, if God has given you time on this earth, the fact that you're listening to me means that you're here. Right? Serve. Come and serve together. Do something because I want to read to you the final verse from Isaiah 9. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding, upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. God's kingdom has, is really here, has really started. And I invite all of you to come and make this uh, FBC a really good church so we can serve another. And, and people from the outside look at us, they will know that in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven.